thankful for that because it got me to, to where I am today. Um, I try and kind of take away some stuff from my dad. My dad's a good coach. Um, and so I was able to do well. I had a big setback with a really bad leg break um, my junior year of high school. Um, I was able to get onto a roster at James Madison University in Virginia. Um, I had four good years there. Um, did well, ups and downs with injuries. And then, uh, was that, was that Los? No, no, somebody else was talking. Okay. Yeah, no, no yeah so I, um, I uh, was able to, after school for a little bit, I got invited to a trial at, um, the Richmond Kickers and went there, did well, made the team and then tore my hamstring. So it was another setback. Um, so moved out to California. I was kind of, you know, frustrated with everything. Uh, started working, saved my money, and I moved to Italy um, to, after two years of working, to try and play some more and just travel and do reconnect with my family in Italy. And I ended up living there for almost four years, got my coaching license while I was there, and then I got an opportunity to come back, worked at Northeastern originally. After Northeastern is when I ended up at UMass Lowell. Um, with Carlos was the first group that I was able to coach, um, there. And then from there, um, was able to coach the women's team. I coached the Boston breakers professional team, um, as an assistant coach. And I was the head coach of the reserve team. And then I moved on. I was at Harvard for a couple of years and now finally at Boston college. Thanks Frankie. And guys, I tell you all the time, every time we do these, make sure you have a notebook and and a pencil because uh, the stuff that we'll be able to gain from from all the people that we invite go further than 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 just the field. And like Frankie was saying, um, although he had a, a, a great soccer career, there were so many other things that he was able to incorporate through through the time maybe when he was injured or when he was up um, abroad. And 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 now being able to still be part of of the game in a different manner, um, but learning from every every stage of his life, whether it was youth, professional. Or, or coach so so have your notebooks ready because we, we will go over this all of these interviews eventually I'll be testing you guys um, so Frankie yeah I sent you the the article it was about club all of the yeah. other, all of the other articles have been about soccer players so I thought that I'd bring a coach on board for for this one um, and we'll go right into it so in the in the article we he, he starts off with with uh, one of his worst um, pre-game speeches that he's ever done and you think of club and like can he actually do something like that can he actually miss the point in before a game because his teams come out flying um so so my question my first question was for you was um could you share with us an example um that you that you of a time that you felt that a certain method that you used to deliver um your message uh perhaps didn't work and and what did you learn from that scenario uh yeah i can think of i can think of two like one, one specifically, I don't know if you were there the year we were playing Bulls USL. Um, it was, we we're playing at Seacoast and we missed like, I don't know how many opportunities. It was an unbelievable. We were playing great, but we couldn't score. Renix was on the team. He had, you know, he was in front of net a few different times and it just wasn't going. It was one of those days halftime came around and it was just, you had that feeling in your inside, like you missed so many chances that, um, you knew a loss was almost coming. Uh -huh. You know, you're like, it's just a matter of time. We give up one, we go down mentally. So at halftime, I decided, to, uh, I remember talking to the, to the wingbacks and I was like, you know, the strikers, and I said this and I regretted it immediately after saying it, especially with Simon, who was our striker at the time, he was a good striker. He was, you know, all ACC at Boston College. He was on the uh, Swedish youth national teams. Um, and I said, listen, if the strikers aren't going to get it done, you know, you wing backs and you number 10s, you got to step up. And, and I, what I wanted to say was, you know, we need <laughs> more from other areas of the field. And I messed up and I said, it just the way it came out and the second it came out, I knew that the strikers weren't going to score for the rest of the day. You lost so yeah. I ruined them, you know? And so, you know, I'm usually the guy who was like, I don't work where like you play in spite of me. I work that, you know, we play together and we're doing it together and it's family and it's love and we try and make it happen that way. So that just went completely against kind of who I am and it, it, it ruined us. We ended up tying the game and we needed to win. So that was one example. And then another example is when I was coaching the, um, at UMass Lowell with the women's team, 
I was, I was talking about the other team in relation to position for numbers and they didn't know the numbers on the position. So I was like, their number six is here and their number 10 oh, is okay, here. Okay. And they, you know, they didn't understand that I was talking about the holding midfielder and the number yeah. 10 and no one was going to say anything. So I talked for, you know, seven minutes of a 10 minute halftime and it was lost <laughs> because no one knew what I was saying. So that was another example. So I just don't, don't ever, don't ever assume two things, I guess. Don't ever assume um, that the, your audience is mm-hmm. going to just know everything you're talking about. You know, you have to really be in touch with your audience. And bo- in both situations, I would say, probably with the women um, first, I didn't know them that well yet. So I made a mistake with that. I should have, I sh- if I had known them better, I would have known that. Um, but there were a lot of moving parts. I had just taken over. So I was trying to do a million different things. And then for the other thing at halftime is you just got to, you got to be careful with your words, with your word choice and it can go the opposite way. So. Yeah, that's, that's good. And I mean, I think for, for us as coaches is, is just being aware of the audience, like you said, but for the player, um, feeling that it's okay to ask if, if right. you don't, if you don't understand something, if, if perhaps the co- coach is saying something and, and we, we get a lot of coaches in, in, um, youth soccer who are working with college players and sometimes we'll use language that we would use um with with different players and, right. and perhaps we forget that you guys are are at a different level um and and finding that relationship that nobody's gonna look down to you if you say hey coach I didn't get this because probably if you didn't get it another five or six didn't get it and now we're gonna go on the field and and it's gonna get worse and then we'll run into maybe a scenario like halftime when Frankie was talking about that, everything is a is out of emotions. Um, so those those are really good that that teach both the player and the coach on on how to work more as 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 a relationship as opposed to more transactional. Um, right. We'll go right into the next one. Which um, so in in the article, club says that that there's times where he just forgets about about the score or, or when he thinks back to games, he can't remember which ones he actually won. That there's something further that that he remembers um and and i think um we're very caught up in in, in a result based um game which which at the end of the day results are, are a big part of 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 what we do um but I, I wanted to ask you how do you how do you measure um your team success um and how do you measure your individual success as a coach um and it could be like i have to get at least 500 results wise or maybe there's something different that you look for so what what how do you break that down so I, there's a good book that um, it talks about Bill Walsh as a football coach and it talks about and this, the title is the score takes care of itself. So I never, you know, that's, if you do all the other things, right, the score, you know, will, you know, will work. So there's um, one of my friends um, is a, is a Danish coach and uh, there's actually numbers that correlate to the, to the game where in any soccer game, there's this, you can talk about shots on goal. You can talk about throw-ins and free kicks and everything, but there's, there's about 5% of the game that is luck. Mm. That doesn't matter. So no matter how much you prepare, there's 5% of the game that you can go one way or the other. So you talk about pro teams, and I always try and keep this in mind because when you watch you know, analysts after the game, they'll be like, oh, these guys are you know, amazing, this and that. They, they did everything they needed to do but it was, you know, a free kick that won them the game and they were under it the whole time. And so they forget, you know, the game can go one way or the other. If you're only worried about the score, you're going to be, you're going to be up and down and high and low way too often. And and you're going to make rash decisions based on wins and losses that if you kind of try to take that out of it and you more focus on, you know, the next step, I know it's easy to say, but it, it does help a lot because, um, you know, everyone can't wait to, in the pro game, fire the coach, you know, get rid of the coach. He doesn't know what he's doing or anything like that. Everyone can't wait to point the finger. But if you have a plan in set in, you know, place that everyone can follow, you guys are all going to go down, down the road together and it's going to get better. For me, the metric that I use is once I start seeing people make the right decisions on their own. And I don't have to tell them. So at first when I coach and Carlos knows I do a lot of talking from the sideline, I'll try and help them direct and get the ball going. But as the, as the years go on or as the season progresses, which you'll, 
inevitably happens is they just do it on their own. And if you see the players start to make the correct decisions, the game goes from when you take over a youth team and everything's very nervous, the one thing I try and put in place is that it's okay to make mistakes. Like let's build out of the back. Let's solve the problem with the ball. And it's very clear. It goes from, you know, we can't do this. Let's kick the ball to, okay, let's figure it out and let's move the ball. And it's, it takes a little while to happen, but it's definitely clear to see. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but if you're getting the ball in front of goal and you're doing the right things to arrive there, the other stuff, who knows, you know, it's raining, the wind is blowing, the goalkeeper's playing out of his mind, those things you can't really control. So if the, if the style of play goes from ugly to attractive and it's decision-making with joystick to decision-making where the players are doing it on their own, um, that to me is the biggest level of success. And in, inevitably and naturally with all the teams that thankfully I've coached, for the most part, as the season goes on, we get better. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I think uh, a lot of the time as players, maybe we expect the coach to always has the, have the answers. And sometimes the coaches feel that the player should have known better what to do in that given scenario. Um, but I think like you're saying, like if, if both have a clear idea of, of what the steps are and we're here today and this is where we're looking to be tomorrow, it eliminates whether we won or lost because like you said, that, that 5% um, and especially in a game that has so many factors and it's depending on 11, it's 22 players on the field and, and it's human error all over the place, um, allows you to, it, it allows you to assess the end result a little bit um, risky. Um, right. So, so it, the it one adds, guy that I took away from that told me too is ACE. So that's the one thing you can keep in your mind, ACE, ACE, attitude, concentration and effort. Those are the only three things that you control in the game. Everything else is out of your hands. The referee, the other team, everything else is completely out of your hands except for those three things. So when you get your chance to go on the field and play, you know, so make say the those most one more time. A C C A C A. So ACE, A C E. So A-C-E. attitude, concentration, and effort. That's what one of my coaches used to tell me that stuck with me is the attitude, concentration, and effort are the only three things that you can control. Mm. Outside of that, bad call, That's weather, good. other team, who knows? Like, there's so many different factors that go into it. Yeah. You just can't get all riled up one way or the other, you know? Fans, when you get to the next level. And remember the game we were at Northeastern, they were screaming and yelling at us, calling us every name in the book, you know? But, like, <laughs> you, if you let that get to you, you're going to be in a bad place. So, yeah. just, and, and you know, when things get rough, just remember those three things as best you can. Yeah, and, and, and just going from the premise that, that no one on your team is looking to do you wrong or do something harmful for the team, and, and the mistake will happen. Um, right. so, so make sure you guys got those three down, AC, ACE, um, so that we can use them <clears throat> down the line in, in, in our seasons. Um, next question. So I, I, I normally tell the players um, that, that we have we, – as I, we try to create footballers as opposed to just – football players because um, you can be a footballer for your entire life. Um, a football player, the player word of that, of that sentence or, or, or will be removed. Um, but I think you, you, you've been able to, to execute that in, in your life from being able to remain a footballer. And I'm sure you're going to be a footballer forever. Even if you're not coaching, you'll find a way to be a footballer. Um, however, in the, in the article, club says that they, that. This, the game is not life or death. And I think at this age, it's difficult um, for a player to not see it in that way. I think at this age, um, with, with the eagerness or, or the desire to become a professional or get to the next level, we, we lose the perception that there's a lot of things that, that also matter in life. And, and I wanted to pick, uh, in particular, um, you, you had um, Giuseppe not too long ago. He, he, his um his son and and i and i feel like club mentioned a little bit that him having a son gave him a different perspective of of the sport in itself so so how has um the perception of the game changed when when giuseppe came into your life yeah i think um for me because i grew up i was the oldest in my family i always looked at my siblings or my my younger cousins 
And I looked at them and I always remember that, you know, they're playing on some sports team. And I always wanted the coach to treat them right, you know, one way or the other. And I was the oldest, so I could kind of see what was going on. I tried to keep that even before I had my son. I tried to keep that in mind that all you guys, you know, we have to treat each other with respect and, and goes from coach to player just as much from player to coach. So I always tried to keep in mind that you are someone's son. You know, I'm, I'm always coaching somebody's kid and, and, you know, they're loved and they're, you know, so we have to be careful with our words and, you know, it, playing time needs to be discussed, you know, and, and sometimes you're going to be on teams where playing time isn't always the same for everyone. But I think that if you can get that out in the open early and have that discussion, that helps a lot, especially with young guys like yourselves. Um, and then, you know, just be having an open dialogue is important for me. Um, and I took a couple notes on that question. Um, so I would say like, you know, I, <laughs> I think growing up, you know, it was a little bit different in my time. Like, you know, I'm Italian American, my family grew up playing soccer, but when I was six, seven, eight, nine years old, I had to be an advocate for soccer altogether. So I was constantly fighting the fight of, of, of soccer versus baseball or soccer versus basketball or every, and it was always, you know, you know, some kids would pull your, pull your leg a little bit about playing soccer and people wanted me to go and play basketball or play another sport. And, you know, I just ended up being, you know, I, I got kind of stuck um, fighting the fight instead of just kind of being open about everything. And um, I just, I, I look back to that time in my life and I look back to like my son and I'm hopefully that I, I lost ground because I look at him when he's going to get to be a point And I hope that he can just take, and you guys can all just take away what it means to play sports in general, right? So what does it mean to be a, a go to practice? What can you do? What can you learn from that day? It's hard to think this way when you're 13 or 10 years old, but when you go and you say, hey, today I got knocked down five times and I got up five times, that's a life lesson, right? So can you relate every training and practice and game and just pick one thing that day that, you know, brings you back to something in your life outside of soccer, right? So how can I relate this to being a person? How can I, how can I relate this to being a friend? How can I relate this to being a leader and just take lessons away from it that way? And then the game doesn't seem like so life or death because even if you lose, even if you make a mistake, even if you get knocked down 10 times, you know already going in that you're supposed to find a reason for training and a reason for the game. And you're supposed to learn something from it. That's the only reason why you're doing it. So the more times you get knocked down, you should just be happy. Like, okay, I know today that my life lesson is I need to get up 11 times, right? <laughs> and then, <laughs> like, you know that's what's going on, even though it's hard. You know, the guy's doing you a favor. You know, you're learning your lesson. Or you missed three goals. Okay, today I learned that, you know, I'm, I'm going to still try to score at my fourth attempt. So I know perseverance. And just always thinking that, and it's hard when you're young to think like that. I get it. And I, I had trouble thinking like that when I was your age. I'm, every day I have to read, I read another book or listen to another podcast or listen to another interview that reminds me of these things because me too, you know, if I were to lose nine games in a row <laughs> as a coach, you start looking internally and you start questioning everything. So, you know, it's important that we all think on that, on that line of thought. That's good. And, and, and I think just to add a little bit to that and, and, and knowing that, Hey, you're going to have to get up 11 times and you just go with that mindset. Um, I think one, it allows you to, to not take personal, any, any hard tackle or, or anything that your teammate comes to you with, because it's a game of emotions and, and, and in the middle of practice, somebody's going to cuss you out. Somebody's going to take your ankles, but in training, you're in the same team and, and knowing that, Hey, it's just building me. Um, you're going to start to like Frankie said, appreciate, um, this person that continues to make your your training session um a bit harder and 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 the other thing was was every day um having to look for um moments that remind you of that because it's very easily said but um it's it's it can go over our heads in, in our everyday um responsibilities and especially in this time where where we can't go on the soccer field and and be teammates and work on the game um there's so many more variables of the game that we can continue to improve on as soccer players without even touching the ball. Um, th that being said, we still go in and try to continue to stay sharp, but, but so many more aspects that, that will help you not only within the game, but 
down the line in life because Frankie will maybe or maybe or maybe not he'll he'll continue to be a coach but he will forever be a father um and i'm sure a lot of us will eventually be at that stage and, and what can we gain from from the game um in our every days to to be the best son the best father the best brother the best cousin um the best friend um possible to the people around us um so that was that was a really good breakdown of, of that question frankie uh the next one is, is um club and, and we touched upon it a little bit on the previous one with the metric um but club mentions that 98 percent he feels he believes 98 percent of 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 sports is failure and um and as i think through that i don't know if how many of you watch some of the michael jordan last dance thing on on espn and when i think of that he's known to be the greatest um of all time and 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 you think he how many seasons that he played he played 15 seasons and and he won six rings um which means that about nine seasons were failure and he won six of them and and he's known to be the greatest and and even the greatest lost more seasons than he won um so so i wanted to ask you frankie what motivates you despite um having a bad streak of games or even a bad season I, i'm sure um there's been seasons where, where things are just not clicking but what about the game or, or your life or what your upbringing um, allows you to remain motivated in your everyday? Yeah, I think, I think if, if you find something you love to do, mm. you know, then it comes a lot easier. You know, whatever it is, if you love being an architect and you're having trouble getting the, getting the project together, you're going to be more enticed to go and work extra hours and, and do, and do that. I, you know, for three years of my life, I was a medical, I was in medical sales. I was making good money and everything, but I didn't love it, you know, and it took a lot, you know, I quit my job, moved to Europe and wanted to play soccer again. I wanted to get my coaching licenses. So I did it, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful and thankful I did uh, because now when these things happen, if I fail or, you know, I, I, something goes wrong or whatever it is i get motivated and i have that will inside to fix it you know i, I want to learn from it i do want to learn i mean one good example in my life is this past summer you know i i tried to build a team um for usl2 and i didn't know a lot of the guys as well and i wasn't able to recruit properly i kind of took i took players as they came and i i, I went on a resume and i didn't have a lot of contact with the, with the people directly and I got a I got a poor group of guys together attitude wise, and it didn't it, at first it didn't click. And I told myself at the beginning of the summer I wasn't going to quit. You know, I said I'm not quitting. I'm finishing it out. I'm going to figure it out. We weren't going to win or go to the playoffs because we went on a bad streak right off the gate, out of the gate. Um, but I was able to release a couple guys that I thought were an issue, which I learned now that I'd rather go with a certain type of player. And I learned that from the summer. Honestly, I always kind of knew it before, but I. I would be quicker to go kind of with the with a uh, bigger resume and now I've kind of resorted back from that a lot and I'd rather go with the kid that cares and so I learned that from the situation um, I got rid of some guys I brought in younger kids I wanted to play kids that were happy to be there and we won eight games straight and I learned that in one season I went from 0 and 8 to 8 and 0 and we we're you know a little bit above 500 in the end it wasn't great but I learned a lot and I, I was able to adapt. And I think the most successful people are, are willing to willing to adapt. And that's part of failure. And that's part of having that will to come back. If you want to go and you want to fix it, you got to be willing to change at the same time. So it's, it's one thing to go and say, okay, I want to figure out the problem. But if you come to the same, you know, result and you're saying, okay, I want to try the same thing again, or you're not willing to change yourself, then you're never going to actually find the problem. Right. So part of it is having that desire, that burn to fix it. Hmm. And then part of it is the willingness to say, hands up. OK, forget, you know, let's let's try and find a common ground. Um, so I think that it's I think that's kind of the way I think about it. First is do what you love. Second is, you know, have that drive to go back and, and you know, ask yourself questions. And then third is to be willing to change, change yourself. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I. I believe so much in, in 
when, when you're doing something that, that moves you and, and, and that makes your heart pump a little bit different, um, I think you, you are more open to, to going through the rest of the list. And, and I think a big word that stands out for me is, is adaptation. Um, because when you love something um, so much and you're so passionate, it, it allows for you to be flexible and, and adapt to difficult uh, situations, and especially in sports. Um, because like we were saying, uh, you, you lose more. The reality is, and nobody's going to change the reality, that you lose more than you win. Because Premier League, there's 30-something teams. There's one that's going to win. That means the other 30, 31, 32 lost. Um, and and, and, it, and it, takes, it goes beyond um, what the result is and, and you having a special relationship with your craft. And that may be soccer. It may be writing. It might be directing. It might be math. It might be so many different things for us. But um, how can we gain the things that we learn through our current relationship and, and love for the game? Um, to, to incorporate those habits um, in whatever we approach later on. Um, so so if, if you're writing down, put, put in their adaptation is key because right now it's, 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 we're in a place where we've had to adapt no matter what. Um, we, we love so many things um, in groups and, and we're in, in to be tangible, but now we have to be alone. And how do we adapt to continue to develop the soccer players? How do we adapt how does the school um, system adapt to still be able to educate us? Um, and, and because there's this love for humanity to learn, we're going to find a way to adapt, whether it's virtually or whichever way it is. So, so adaptation is, is a very, very important stage um, of, of any craft. And then um, let me see what else I got. I got two more questions, Frankie. I won't take too much of your time. Um, this one is... Uh, so, so I think I have some Liverpool fans here who are going to enjoy remembering this question. So they, they, they had this crazy comeback against Barcelona and Klopp says that the first game was, was the worst possible result ever where Messi just put, <laughs> where Messi just put it at top corner, 3-0. Champions League was basically over. Um, and then um, next, the, the comeback, the, the away game, they're, they're, where they are home. They come back and he happens to miss um, that goal where where everything changed for him. And I think the strongest thing is, is that air, that feeling that is is in, in that he's breathing for the next 48 hours. And and perhaps so many things have gone up and down in his life, but but there was this air that he related to something that's not real and him waking up in the morning and this is still real. Um, in in your in your profession, it could be as a coach or it could be as, as, a, as a player, when did you feel that you hit this moment of magic, that, that this is why I love this game, this is why I coach this game, or this is why I play this game? Um, where, when was this magical moment and why? So, yeah, two things. I, I would say, like, as a, as a player, I was always very – hyper-focused, nervous about games. When I was playing, I always wanted to win. I wanted a mistake-free game, and I kind of I, – I psyched myself out of some games. Then when I was, like, older and I, I was playing after college, I kind of just – I was playing in the lower leagues in Italy, and I was just having fun. Um, so the first thing is my, my team won promotion in Italy, and I played great. And, I, and a lot of it was just because I was teaching English at the time. I wasn't making any real money, but I was able to – fulfill my dream of, you know, at least traveling Europe, going back to Italy and playing and getting friends and having a team environment that I was really craving that I missed when I was working in California. Um, so the, the less I stressed about everything, I just, you know, I took care of myself and I really wanted to win and I slapped an eight right and everything, but I, I wasn't stressed out of the game. I tried to just enjoy the whole process of everything. I, st I played better mm -hmm. I enjoyed it more. And we won, and we won, and it was nice. And the team, the, actually, the team is the same team my grandfather played for. So that was something else, too. And we won, and I got to play for them and wear the jersey. And um, that was special for me. And then I think that was, like, that one moment I was like, ah, oh, man, like, this is always what I wanted to do, you know? And I wanted to do it at the highest level. It didn't work out for me, but it was still yeah. something cool that I got to do, and I'll remember it, you know? Um, but the second, the second thing that went hand in hand, I mean, are you the whole team? putting that team together and building that team was hmm. it's hard because when you're, when you're successful and you're like, you have great success. Like we had, I don't know what Carlos told you guys about our UMass Lowell team, but you know, it was a team that went from division two to division one. Um, Carlos was captain. 
uh, first team all conference. So we went to number three in the country behind um, Maryland and UNC, I think. Yeah. And then it was us, and, and fourth place was Wake Forest. So from UMass Lowell to be not on the map in, in college soccer, to make that stamp was pretty special. And, you know, I was part of building that team. And um, I just used my instincts. I used I, I picked the players I thought I would like. I picked the players that I thought that should have been selected when I was playing in college that no one wanted, really, um, for whatever reason. Um, I stuck to my guns, I think, with um, – my player profiles. I traveled, I worked hard to make it happen and seeing that kind of come to fruition where I made all these great contacts from originally wanting to go to Europe. And then my brother played in Croatia and because, because you make friends, there's not the only thing that you'll, that I, two things I would like to teach you, we'll get to it at the end, but it's relationships. Life is relationships. So if you have people around the world that trust you and you have people that you know, you can trust that information is, is worth, I don't even know how much money because you're eliminating things that you don't have to trust. If you can just always look to build your relationships because that's what happened. And because my brother played in Croatia, he made friends with one of the coaches over there. We became close. And then we got these players, Carlos transferred in from a school that was local that we wiped the floor with later. And they, you know, they tried to tell him that scholarship money wasn't available. And you turn around and you, 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 you stick it to them. And it was great. And we went 13, one and two, and we're top of the top in the country. And at the same time, I was using the same model with my Boston breakers reserve team and picking the players that I thought were best and, and kind of sticking to my guns with that. And then the UMass Lowell men's team goes to number three in the country and wins the conference. And my, you know, my breakers reserve team wins the national championship. So, you know, we were, I felt my goal was right in that moment. You know, I was like, oh man, like, this is it. You know, like I, I got it figured out yeah. and then smack, you know, <laughs> you, you don't. So yeah. that's the best part. That's why we do it. That's why we keep coming back. Right. If it was easy, then it would get boring. So um, I think that, you know, that was a really special thing for me in my life. Um, and I, I was able to, to learn from it. The biggest thing is, and, I, and I'll tell you this, and the team, teams that have won championships, you always want to go back to that moment. You got to get over it. Uh, you got to get over, you got to get over a win. You got to get over a loss because if you harp on the win, you'll take away from tomorrow. Right. So like, enjoy it while it's there. Enjoy, give yourself a week to like, you know, celebrate or whatever it is. But then it's, it's over because if you don't, you start distracting yourself from the present. That's good. That's good. That's so good because I mean, just how we, we got to get over those losses. I mean, the win, keeping it for too long in our brains can be just as, as unhealthy. But um, I think you, you kind of put the entire interview together um, with, with that story and, and looking, describing to us that moment of magic that, that was with, with UMass Lowell, deriving from, from the love that you have for the game and, and to adapt it throughout your life. And then all these things that are happening throughout your life is where this derives from unintentionally because you're not going to talk to people in Croatia because you want to make one day a team in UMass Lowell. Your, your brother's not going to play over there because one day he's going to help you. It's all these things that, that eventually start to, to plan themselves because of that initial love for the game. And, and whether you were a player or a coach, eventually you make somebody else's dream maybe come closer to, to, to becoming true. And perhaps you didn't get the chance to, to stand at the highest stage that you wanted, um, but you've now helping so many other players get to that stage. And when they stand on that stage, it's a little bit of Frankie standing with them. Um, so, so back to the idea that we will not, we will not be players forever. And, and, and you must cherish that as much as possible while you're young. Um, I think you got to adapt, fall in love, like Frankie is saying, with, with what you do. And then, like he said, it was, it was really good that it was, he went by his intuition. And that intuition um, only comes from, from being day in and day out with, with the game, reading about soccer, watching soccer, training soccer, talking to soccer people, um, and, and being open-minded when, when it comes to, to what your craft is. Um, so, Frankie, I think... I think we we got things that man in one session um in one uh hour and 30 30 minute session on the field we will have not gotten anywhere near the amount of material we got here 
Um, and then for me, the last question, and I normally ask um, the the guest um, what they would advise their their thirteen year old self. But but I think I think there's a special air when when we talk about um, Giuseppe, and, and I saw as soon as I said his name, your your smile came. Um, what what advice would you give Giuseppe um, when he's a, a U twelve or a U thirteen player? Yeah, I think I think my job, like ever since I started becoming a father, the only one of the biggest lessons I want to to teach is that failure is okay. That's hmm. the one thing I care more than anything about. If you can see every opportunity or every everything that comes your way as a challenge, and and you can just take it and be happy about the challenge. And if you succeed, great. And if you don't, then you learn from it. Then I think that's the biggest lesson because, you know, it's hard because you see your kid, right? And you're like, oh, he, whatever. He walked for, for his age, he walked early. So can you guys hear me okay? Still? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, cut out. So you want to be like clapping and, you know, like giving them a ton of credit and this and that. But as life goes on, if you treat every situation and you're always patting them on the back and hugging them, like, yeah, you're the best, this and that. And, you know, you, he gets straight A's in school. The, the, the thing you should do is if somebody's getting straight A's, you should be like, oh, that, that's probably too easy for you. You should challenge yourself more. Instead of celebrating all the A's or celebrating all the goals, you should be, you know, and that's my, that's my challenge to myself, I guess, as a father is to be like, okay, not make it easy all the time or not over reward. So if something's too easy, can we use our language to say, okay, wow, good job, but you know, that must be too easy for you. Can you, can you challenge yourself more? And maybe you can push yourself further. And, and within that, I have to be okay if he fails or, you know, because it's not going to be, I don't get to go to work and say, Oh, my kid scored 14 goals. You know, he's not, but he, he's playing in whatever level that, you know, no one really is following. That's, that's not the point. The point is to use every situation as, a learning opportunity and if I can get him to smile at, at, at challenges and, and accept challenges and if you lose or if you fail to say okay that's okay I'm gonna take something away from this I mean that's that's the that's the trick and there hasn't been a single gold medalist that hasn't had a setback if you look at every single one that had that stood up on the podium they all had some severe setback in their life if you if you look at it through and that's been a fact so you know, everyone is, everyone is dealing with something. And I think that's how we respond to the situation that makes us really, really good or, or, you know, or average. And the other thing I'll tell you guys is, um, and I said this and uh, all the time growing up, there's one phrase that if you really want to make it to the top that you're going to need to say all the time. And it's, I can, I have soccer. So like, there's going to be birthday parties. There's going to be every child travel vacation this and that but I can't I have soccer I can't I have soccer and if you are okay saying that and you have you stand a chance to to continue to grow and play at the next level but if you're you know rather stay up till midnight and not get to bed at 9 30 and you have a game the next day because it's somebody's birthday party it's not a good road to go down so it's just it's just about and it's okay there's you know the other thing is there's no such thing as a bad soccer player. There's the wrong level, mm. right? So if you want to be – what's that? It's a game of opinions. You might be good to right. say Right, a game or... of opinions. Right. So if you want to be, you know, a, a Division One college player and play in the MLS and go to the World Cup, you know, that's great. You're going to have to make sacrifices. If you want to enjoy your game and also, you know, do other things, that's great too. And there's a level for that. You know, so I would I would say the more often you're willing to say I can I have soccer, the bit, the more chance you have of of fulfilling your dreams in 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 this game. But you might have to say the same thing for for other things. I can I have mm -hmm. math lesson. I can I have this. I can have that. The more you can say that and deny yourself, you know, the temptation, the more successful you'll be. Yeah, and, and I think just identifying. Um... What, what it is that where you want to be um and if it's soccer then so be it but but if you're journaling or whatever it is just just write that sentence down i can't i have and just leave, put a blank in it and, and and continue to pursue what it is because i know we love soccer um but perhaps there's something that moves you a little bit more and i don't want to in 
force you to, to just put, I can't, I, I love soccer, but like Frankie's saying, whatever it is, it's going to take discipline. It's going to take saying no to other things um, that won't, that won't get you there. Um, but Frankie, I, I just want to thank you so much for, for taking some time. I know you, you have a lot of things going on, especially with all this crazy um, Corona stuff and, and, and how everything's changing for, for the college game. Um, the, the boys appreciate all of the wisdom that you share. Blaskis is on the call. I don't know if you saw him as well. It's always good to, to he's always happy to see you. Um, Who's on there? Blaskis. Blaskis, is he there? Yeah, can you see yeah. him? Oh, what's up? I didn't see him. <laughs> I didn't have the gallery view on. I know it's up. I, I, <laughs> have, I have the young face, you know? Yeah, um, so yeah. actually, so Frankie recruited, he, he brought he brought the entire Yeah, 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 I know. Um, so it was nice to, to hear you talk about, about that team. But um, again, thank you, Frankie, and, and I hope you guys stay healthy. Um, I can't wait to see where, where Giuseppe is going to end up um, in his soccer career. And if not, wherever, um, I know you're going you're gonna to lead him the right way. Um, Thanks, boys, buddy. All right, thank you guys for having me. Listen, good luck, okay? Sounds good. Boys, make sure you're going over the notes, and um, we're always here to help you as much as possible, even through this strange stage. Um, Thank you, Frankie. Thank you, Blast. Thank you, everybody right, who showed up today. Take care. Carlos, you guys. Talk to you. Thanks. Later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.